What are the things that make you angry? Think about in your mind right now the things that make you angry. Maybe you have people coming to your mind. Maybe you have situations. Maybe you have things that were done to you or things that you yourself have done. And you get angry when you think about them. Now, oftentimes, when we get angry, not all the time, but oftentimes, the reason why we get angry is because we ourselves are sinful. We are upset. We are angry because something didn't go our way. We wanted it our way, and it didn't go that way, and then we lash out in anger in an inappropriate response. Now, Not all the time is that true, because yes, there are times where maybe you have been hurt, or maybe you have been taken advantage of, or abused, or anything like that, and you have a right reason to feel angry about that. Because what we're going to see here in these verses is that Jesus himself got angry. He did not get angry all the time, but there are a few moments throughout the Gospels where we see Jesus get angry. And so we must ask this question First of all, what causes Jesus to get angry? And then how, what should we respond to that? What is the thing that Jesus gets angry about? And how do, we, how do we react to that? How do we respond to that? And what do we do because of that? Well, as we're going to see in these verses in Mark chapter 3, we're going to see that the thing that causes and drives Jesus to anger is the state of one's hardened heart. We're going to see a story in Mark chapter 3 with the Pharisees, who we've been interacting with for a while now, and we see their reaction to something that Jesus said, and Jesus, in response to that, was angry at the state of their hearts. And for us, what this means and what this teaches us, this is our big idea for tonight, you can write this down, is that Jesus came to expose the state of my heart. Jesus came from heaven to earth to expose, to shine light on, to reveal the state or the condition of my heart. Jesus came to expose the state of my heart. Now, when I speak of the heart, I'm not speaking of the organ in your body that pumps blood throughout your body. I'm speaking of your innermost being, your heart, who you are. You feel like, you know, you're like, oh, with all my heart and soul, everything inside of me, that's what I'm speaking of. And that's what Jesus is speaking of here. And so what we're going to do is we're going to read through these verses, and I'm going to break them down as we go. And then we're going to see how we must respond to the example of the Pharisees and look at our own hearts and look at our own selves and see what Jesus has to say about that. And so let's start. Mark chapter 3, verse 1. Let's get our eyes on the Bible. Verse 1 says this. Again, he, Jesus, entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. So, as we'll come to find, this was the Sabbath day, and last week we talked about what the Sabbath day is. It's a day of physical rest and spiritual refreshment. And what would happen was that God's people would go to the synagogue, which was just the temple where they heard and learned God's word. So Jesus, most likely with his disciples, went into the synagogue. And here it says that there was a man with a withered hand, a man with a a crippled hand, a handicapped man. We don't know how that happened or why that happened to him, but all we know is that he's there just like anyone else, just there to listen to God's word. Now verse 2, it says, and they... This is the Pharisees, the religious experts, the professional uh, people who followed God, and yet they were crooked in their hearts. It says, they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him, the man with the withered hand, on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. If you remember last week, the Pharisees criticized Jesus and his disciples because they were walking and they picked grains while they were, when they were hungry on the Sabbath. And they said, hey, you can't do that. You're working on the Sabbath. When in reality, they were just eating when they were hungry. And so in this case, they're seeing if Jesus is going to heal this man who clearly has a problem. 
And it says that they watched Jesus so that they might accuse him. Now, imagine if you were this man with the withered hand. You're just, you know, a, you're just a regular person, and yet you have something that sets you apart from people. And maybe, maybe that's true for some of you in the room. Maybe you have a handicap or some sort of disability or something that makes you different. Maybe you've experienced something in your life that makes you feel like an outcast. Surely this man with the withered hand felt that his entire life. And yet, in this moment, when he's in the synagogue, the religious leaders, the very ones who should be caring for him, are just looking at him, seeing if Jesus was going to heal him. They didn't even see this guy as a person. They just saw him as, maybe if Jesus heals him, then we can criticize Jesus so that we can get rid of Jesus and have everything be how we want it to be. That would make one feel I mean, just imagine how this man may have been feeling from the looks or the stares that he was getting from people all the time, especially these people who he probably would have looked up to. But Jesus did not see him like the Pharisees did. He did see him as a person. In fact, look at verse three. He said to the man with the withered hand, come here. Jesus could probably sense what was going on here in the room. He probably called out to the man. I imagine him, you know, if, it was, if Jesus was even teaching, he probably said, hey, come over here. And he looked at everyone as everyone was looking at him. And this is what he said. Look at verse four. He said to them, to the Pharisees, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? So Jesus now, with this man right next to him, looks at the Pharisees and asks them a simple question, truly. He says, is it lawful, saying, is it right to do good or to do harm? To do good, right? Is it lawful, is it right to save life or to kill? Now, the fact that the Pharisees remained silent would have been absurd to everyone else who was in the synagogue at the time. Because remember, these Pharisees, they knew the law of God. They knew the Old Testament. They knew that God wants to do good and wants to save life. And so Jesus is asking them an easy question. And yet they remain silent because it revealed the state of their heart. Look at verse 5. And he, Jesus, looked around at them. I imagine Jesus looking at all of them individually into the eyes. And he looked around at them with anger, with fury, grieved, deeply saddened at the hardness of heart. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and his hand was restored. Jesus, the thing that makes Jesus angry is hearts that are unmoved, that are like stones to the love and power and mercy and grace of God. The Pharisees were so cold to the idea that God was working. They didn't care about what God was doing. They wanted things to be how they wanted it to be done. That's why Jesus was such an annoyance to them, and yet that's why Jesus was so angry at them, because they were, they were just, they were unmoved. They, they didn't care. They didn't show emotion because things weren't going how they wanted it to go. They would rather accuse Jesus of doing something wrong, of healing someone, which is a very good thing, of restoring. I mean, imagine this guy who knows how long he had had this withered hand. If you witnessed this, wouldn't you be just overwhelmed with joy? You'd be like amazed. You'd say, wow, that was so awesome. And yet they, what was their response? Look at the end of the passage, verse six. It says, the Pharisees went out immediately, held counsel and held counsel with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. They leave the synagogue and immediately get with the Herodians. Who are the Herodians? Well, the Herodians were the people who worked for King Herod. King Herod was the one who was uh, 
one of the top dogs in the Roman Empire, all those types of people. So they, the, the Pharisees and the Herodians would not like each other. Imagine like the most like far right, like activist person you can think of and then think of like the most like far left, like liberal. That's like how different these people were. That's how much they would have hated each other. And yet they were united in their hatred for Jesus, which paints a picture of how much Jesus was disliked. And in fact, not only did they dislike Jesus, it says they held counsel, they met together with the Herodians to see how to destroy him. I believe the reason why they remained silent when Jesus asked, is it better to do good or to do harm or to save life or to kill, the reason why they remained silent is because Jesus exposed the state of their heart. They wanted to do harm. They wanted to kill. It says right here, they wanted to see how they could destroy Jesus. Now, it's very easy to read this story, true story, and think, man, those Pharisees, Those guys are a piece of work. They are ridiculous. I can't believe that anyone would act like that. But we would do ourselves well to not just see this as as something like, oh man, I'm glad I'm not like that, and instead see it as an opportunity to look within our own hearts and see where our hearts are at. So I have a few questions for us, and we'll see what God will do with it. First of all, what does it mean to have a hard heart? What does, that, what does that mean? Well, a hard heart, this is a definition I got from a pastor, a hard heart lacks ordinary feeling of, of tenderness or compassion or just general sympathy. It just, it lacks it. It's a heart that cannot be touched or moved or made to feel anything toward suffering. It's like, a, it's like a stone. A hard heart is unmoved, unfeeling, and unresponsive to the love of God. And the truth is, all of us, apart from God, have hard hearts. If you think of your life before Jesus came in, or maybe you're in this place now, we all have hard hearts. But some of us, our hearts have been changed. Well, how does my heart change? Well, it changes through a work of God that's fulfilled in Jesus. Now, Jesus, or, uh, God gave us a promise in the Old Testament from a prophet named Ezekiel, and Jesus fulfilled this. This is what he writes. He says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, a heart that is living, that's tender, that can actually feel and be receptive to things that are happening. If you've experienced, if you've called on the name of Jesus and your life has been changed by him and you would call yourself a disciple or call yourself a Christian, you have been made a new creation. You've been given a new heart, a heart of flesh, as the Bible says, one that can actually receive and rejoice in what God is doing. But even a heart of flesh that's been changed by God can grow to become stagnant and distant and hard from what God is doing. So how do we keep our hearts from getting this way? Well, we encourage one another and be together with other people in, the, uh, in church or in the body of Christ, as it's called. Now, there's a verse in Hebrews 3.13. I would write this down, Hebrews 3.13. This is how we ought to react to and respond to the way that our hearts will often turn to not uh, wanting to hear what God has. This is what it says. It says, continually encourage one another or exhort one another. It just means be together with the people of God. Surround yourself with the truth of God. Pray to God in prayer that he may help you. Do that every single day so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. 
Sin lies. It lies to you. It wants you to believe that your life would be better without God. That's what sin wants you to believe. And if we do not counter the lies of Satan, the lies of sin with the truth, we will start to go down a path where we are obeying our sin rather than obeying our Lord. One uh, pastor said this. He said, the main lie of sin is that God and his ways are not satisfying. And if we give place to those lies, if we accept them, they start to grow in our heart and our hearts will become like stone. We will then become to love sin. And then the things that were once beautiful about God will become boring to us. And then God himself will begin to bore us. And one day we will wake up like a stone unable to enjoy God. So we must ask, how do I check my heart? Well, Jesus does that for us in verse four. Look again at verse four. He said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath? Really what he's saying, is this lawful? Is this right to do on any day? These things to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill. You see, the Pharisees, they were concerned with Jesus doing something outwardly. They were saying if he was gonna heal him or not heal him. But Jesus went right past that because he knew the content of their hearts. So he asks a question to them that would expose the state of their heart. And he's asking this question to us tonight. This is how you know where your heart is. Your heart has become hard if you seek to do harm and you seek to kill. Now, I don't mean literally kill, but I mean like tear down people or be nasty to them or disregard them. And you have a soft heart, a heart that receives what God has if you're seeking to do good and you're seeking to save life, to build other people up, to encourage them in the truth and point them back to who Jesus is. So we must ask ourselves these kinds of questions like, who do I love more? Do I love Jesus more or do I love myself or my grades or my sports or my accolades or the perception of what other people think about me? What do I love more? Do I seek opportunities to bless people, to encourage people, to build people up, to be genuinely kind to them, to seek out the person who needs a friend? Do I do that? Or do I seek to do harm, where I seek to intentionally disregard someone or avoid them, or even worse, I'm nice to their face, and the second that they turn their back, I think to myself, I don't even have to say it out loud, but I think to myself, I can't stand that guy. That guy is, I I hate that guy. That, no matter what you do outwardly, is exposing the contents of a hard heart. We say one thing, but we mean another And here, Jesus is graciously, this is not a harsh thing that he's doing, he is graciously offering us a chance to look within ourselves, within our own hearts, to see where our hearts are at. And so what we're going to do to close is we are going to check our hearts. Some of the leaders around have uh, some note cards that you guys will be uh, given a chance to write on. I would have these questions up on the screen, but again, the screen is not working. But we're going to ask ourselves these questions, and I'll repeat them a few times, so maybe you can even write them down on your cards. I'll say them now, and we'll think about them. One is, who do I love more, Jesus or myself? What do I want to do more? Do I want to do good to others, or do I want to do harm? What are my intentions with other people? To build them up or to tear them down? And how can God change my heart? 
I'll, I'll repeat them. What I want to say before I repeat them, I need everyone to listen. This is a moment between you and God. If you think for a second that you write the right answer on this, that it's going to make any difference between you and your relationship with God, you're mistaken. Because the truth of the matter is that God can only work with the real you. So if you're trying to be something that you're not, God can't work with that. He can only work with where you actually are. And so this is a moment, this is an opportunity where you can be real before God. So here are the questions again. And you can write them out, you can pray to yourself, you can do whatever you would like. Here are the questions. Who do I love more, Jesus or myself? What do I want to do more, to do good or to do harm? What are my intentions with other people, to build them up or to tear them down? And how can God change my heart? Yes. What do I want to do more, to do good or to do harm? Anyone need me to repeat them again? I'll do it one more time. Who do I love more, Jesus or myself? What do I want to do more of? Do I want to do good or do harm? What are my intentions with others to build them up or to tear them down? And how can God change my heart? I'll be sitting. Actually, I'll, be just come, I'll just be right here. If you, if you need me to repeat them, you can just call me over. And uh, Adam's going to play a few uh, chords for us. And um, then he'll lead us into a song. I'm going to pray. I know some of you have already started, and that's okay. But I'm going to pray. Lord God, I... I just pray that in this moment, Lord, where uh, we are just being honest before you, that we truly would be honest, that we wouldn't hide anything from you. Lord, you already see us. We don't have to hide from you. In fact, we actually can't hide from you. So I pray for all of us here in the room right now that we would not try to put up something to hide from you, but instead, Lord, that we would graciously with you walk into the light that you would expose the state of our heart. Not in a way that we would feel bad about ourselves, but in a way that we would be encouraged that you love us, that you call us to something greater. I pray, Lord, that our hearts would not become hardened to the things that are so great about you, but instead that we would rejoice in who you are. That's the life of a Christian. That's the life of a disciple, one who has found their joy in Jesus. And so I pray, Lord, that even in this moment, if there are hearts in the room that have become hardened to the things of you, that you would swap those out for a hearts of flesh, that you would do that in all of us, Lord, and that those who already have the hearts of flesh, that you would help them to become more and more receptive to who you are. We need you, Lord. We cannot do anything apart from you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. And thank you that you do not shy away from the things that are uncomfortable. I pray that you'd be with us now in this time. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.